Good morning. I think uh, from what I'm watching, you probably got to watch me sit here and fool with my paperwork for about 45 seconds here, but that's okay. Uh, I just want to say good morning. I hope you're having a blessed Sunday morning. And I always say this every week, and uh, but I always like to. If you're listening to our live stream for the first time, my name's Glenn Weeks, and I lead our men's Sunday school class here at Bright City First Baptist Church. And uh, Today's lesson, is a, it's a powerful lesson if you really, uh, I hope you get to pay attention to it. And it's called How God Justifies. So as we study that, I want you to remember, if God declares us right, innocent, free, and righteous, who can say otherwise? Um, we're going to read today how Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus' birth, prophesied many things that happened in Jesus' life to justify those who would believe. So as we get ready to open, uh, I always like to open with prayer, if you'll just join me. Heavenly Father, I pray for understanding, I pray for inspiration, and a clear mind as we continue to study the prophetic message you gave to Isaiah about your servant and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, help us, Father, at times when we struggle to truly understand and humbly accept your word. You are our God, and we are your children of faith. Heavenly Father, lead, guide, and direct each word I speak today. Amen. Uh, just go back a little bit. On Wednesday, we celebrated Veterans Day, and my father was a World War II disabled veteran, and he always made sure that we understood this sacrifice, these sailors and soldiers and all those in the military who fought and died for our freedom to benefit us. He always made us understand the importance of that, but do we truly understand that suffering and that sacrifice that they did for us each each time? And I, and I hope this Wednesday when we celebrate, I hope you took opportunity to do that. But then in our lesson today, we're going to hear Isaiah prophesies about a suffering servant that he foresaw coming for the purpose of paying for the sins of uh, all. Um, he foresaw a time when those who would believe could find forgiveness, when they could find restoration, when they could find peace with God. Uh, I know a lot of people fight that battle. And as I said, some 700 years before Jesus' birth, Isaiah prophesies a remarkable description of Jesus' life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection and, and, and what it was going to encompass. Uh, and, uh, and I hope today in this lesson, not by me, but by, by, by God's word, I hope we, in our lesson today, we get a better understanding of what Isaiah prophesied about this suffering servant and some insight to how God deals with sin both uh, as a as a just and in a just and a merciful manner, I guess is the best way to say it. So in our lesson day it begins in the first three verses of Isaiah fifty three and and it continues to speak about this suffering servant who and listen to what I say that would suffer and die for the sins of all people. All people. So please follow along as I read these uh, verse if you have a quarterly or if you have your Bible. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like some one people would turn away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. How do you feel when you hear this prophesied description of Jesus? Uh, would, you, would you believe God chose this humble, suffering service rather than uh, a glorious king for someone to look upon to save the sins of the world. Um, and you know, this this idea that I'm speaking about today, it's contrary to human pride in worldly ways. Uh, in verse one, Isaiah asks these two questions, beginning with, who has believed what we have heard? Well, I can tell you that a lot of people didn't. Uh, and they still don't today. 
And then the second question he asked is, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah is basically saying it's going to be a difficult reception uh, the servant would receive from the people. And you you hear Isaiah prophesies about this, about his appearance and about the things back. You know, in the movies and the pictures you see of Jesus, it's depicted as a good-looking man with long hair and a well-trimmed beard and a, a good physical body. But in verse 2, we're told that the servant would grow up just like a, any other child. Uh, and there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his physical appearance. Uh, Isaiah, actually, Isaiah prophesied that he, he would not have the appearance or anything that would make him stand out to where people would desire him. Uh, you you know do you know I thought about this you know ordinary people that uh, God has used to accomplish some extraordinary things in his plan of salvation and then me and Ted were just talking a minute ago talking about God's plan and uh, and do you think a lot of people don't understand the importance of Jesus life and his work on earth and I'm going to tell you the answer is absolutely you know, that's why it's so important that as faithful believers, we point out Jesus' extraordinary nature. Uh, um, Isaiah goes even further in verse 3 to say, This man of sorrow is going to be despised and rejected by most of those around him. And that's it's still true today. Jesus is rejected in so many ways by this world. Uh, some, some stand against Jesus. Some reject his offer of forgiveness. Yeah, and some commit acts of hatred against those who believe. Uh, so the question is this, uh, and this let's ask, do you despise him? Do you reject him? Or do you accept him? And I think as Christians, that's, that's our choice to accept him. And I want you to listen in the next part of our lesson here in Isaiah uh, 53, 4 through 6. And it talks about the substitutes, and that's exactly what the, this uh, suffering servant was. He was a substitute for us. And listen to these uh, verses here. Yet he himself bore our sickness. He carried out our pain, but in turn we regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquity, Punished for our peace was on him, and we were healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and to the and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. As I as I was reading here, you think this man that died more than seven hundred years before Jesus was even born understood the idea of. Christ dying for our sins, for our transgressions, for our iniquities, uh, and the bearing of the punishment that we des honestly deserved. Uh, did you did you hear this amazing truth as I was reading here uh, revealed about this suffering servant of God? You know, today this theological doctrine I just read about is known as substitutionary atonement, and. Uh, the Apostle Paul expressed basically the same knowledge or same doctrine in 2 Corinthians 5.21 when he wrote, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so they, that we might become rice, the righteousness of God in him. So as I read that, you see how God through the prophet Isaiah was pulling aside a, a curtain of time for the people of Isaiah's day to look forward to the suffering of the Messiah for the forgiveness uh, it was going to be made available to all mankind uh, Isaiah pointed out in these verses seven ways that the servant uh, took our place as a substitute He's, when he said he bore our, he bore our uh, uh, sickness he carried out our pains he was pierced because of our rebellion crushed because of our iniquities Punished for our peace. And it says by our wounds. And where it says that he's referring here to this spiritual healing, these wounds. And he said, and the Lord punished the servant for the iniquities of us all. 
And uh, in verse 6, Isaiah refers to Israel as straying from God and compares them to wandering sheep. Verse 6 says, we all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. So you think... Uh, do you, you think in your life you could ever been referred to as a wandering sheep outside of, of where God would want you to be? Do you think there, and do you think there's still a lot of people that are lost in these sins and transgressions? And you know, and we know they are. Uh, yet, just like these people of Israel, God sent Christ in the world for all who would believe. Uh, but here's the thing about us now: we have the hindsight to know the identity of this Messiah, all he did while he walked on earth. And it's written in the word of God uh, about how he lived, how he died for his sins. And you know, and one of the things it says, in it, and it talks about his resurrection here. But uh, yet knowing all that we know about Jesus, uh, many still ignore, they turn away and they reject God's offering for forgiveness. Uh, I think sometimes we need to be reminded that Jesus did more that just than just provide an example for us to follow. Jesus actually suffered and died this substitutionary death in our place, bearing our punishment we deserved. In the next part of our lesson today, we're going to hear Isaiah emphasize his suffering service willingness to be sacrificed for others. And... Uh, it's in uh, verses uh, 7, chapter 53 of Isaiah, and verses 7 through 9 here. And the writer of this lesson titled this, this part of it willingly. Uh, but follow along as I read these verses. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter and like a sheep silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. He was taken because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. In the Old Testament, uh, we read these stories of people uh, who suffer, who, you know, who went to these sacrifices, they offered animals as a sacrifice for their sins. And, you know, in the temple, we read about every morning they would, and evening, they would sacrifice a lamb uh, in the temple for the sins of the people. In these verses, Isaiah talks about a sinless servant of the Lord who would suffer the oppression and the affliction of others. Uh, in these verses, Isaiah uses the example of a lamb or a sheep uh, led to slaughter or led before a shear. You know, in verse 7 it says, he did not open his mouth. This further implies the shepherds of the people, closest servant, they didn't truly understand. If you go and read and study, this, they didn't truly understand or they didn't care who the servant was. Yet they, yet as they led him, the servant didn't tell him he, you know, he was the son of God. He walked on with him. He, he, he didn't protest. He didn't try to put his position with God. Uh, you remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus coming. Uh, and you read over in John one twenty nine. it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As I read this, you know, to pay the penalty for sin, a life had to be given. And God chose to provide the sacrificial offering himself here. Uh, the sins of the world were, were, to, were going to be removed when Jesus died as a perfect sacrifice. Uh, in the, these verses here, Isaiah points out uh, that the servant suffered was voluntary. And, and we know that by reading these words. No words of complaint passed his lips. Uh, Verses 8 and 9 actually describe what would happen to Jesus some 700 years later. He was taken away because of, of oppression and judgment. Basically taken away by uh, 
an unjust arrest and a trial as we know. He died a painful death. He, uh, and yet he was given this honorable burial among the rich. And here's what it says in these verses prophesied by Isaiah. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in him. And it talks about this servant was spared this final disgrace intended by his enemies. And a question I found as I studied these verses is in what sense does, does life truly begin? As we surrender for God's purpose, you know, as we study, as believers to surrender in what it talks about in this spiritually means that we give up our own will and we subject our will to a higher power. We're not staying in these worldly ways. We subject to this higher power. You know, Matthew 8, 3 says, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's saying we must be hum become humble with a sincere heart. I, that's what it means to be willing uh, here. And that's what Jesus was. He was willing. This example that Isaiah prophesied, we see Jesus willingly do some 700 years after this, you know. And in the last part of our lesson we're going to read today, it talks about that sacrifice. As a matter of fact, it's in verses 10 through 12 there in chapter uh, 53. But the, the writer of this lesson, it talks about sacrifice. Now, I want you to listen to this. And, and this one of these points I'm going to bring out in this part of the lesson. It says, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guild offering, he will see a seed. He will prolong his days, and by giving his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see the light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as, a, as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death, and was counted among the rebels. Yet he bore the sin of many, and interceded for the rebels. Verse 10 opens with something. I Well, I guess you might consider a surprising statement. It says, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him, crush him severely. Was pleased to crush him severely. But I want you to remember what I've said about God's perfect plan of redemption. You know, there was, there was no other way for human sin to be exposed and condemned to provide a way for... Uh, Forgiveness and external, and you know, this eternal life for sin. There was no other way. God's plan was the way, and this was God's plan from the beginning. Um, and we shouldn't ignore, I'm, I'm going to say this too, we shouldn't ignore the responsibility of these wicked men who plotted Jesus' death. But we also must realize God Himself chose the course for His servant. And he, here's something. Uh, sacrifice you know in verse 11 it basically tells us of the after uh, after the anguish of his suffering and death the servant would see the light and would be satisfied you know uh, through the servant died as a sacrifice we must always understand you know this death this servant will and it talks about he's going to see his offspring prolong his days and actually it talks about being an the servant's going to be the agent who carries God's will for men. And see the light of life. Gain this great satisfaction. And, you know, take his place among the great and gain the treasures associated with this victory. This victory in Jesus we talk about or we sing about. You know, verse 11 talks about uh, the anointed family of believers who become righteous. Not by their words but by the Messiah's work on the cross. Um, some might say, how could a dead man continue past the time of his self-sacrifice and gain all these rewards? What Isaiah prophesied in these verses about the life, death, burial, and resurrection as Jesus gives us this 
It gives us this historical. We're we're on the other side of it. it gives us historical, uh, you know, definitive answer of God. Uh, God raises servant to life again. Death couldn't hold him captive inside this this grave. It, we're we're the beneficiaries of the servant's sacrificial act, and I don't know how many times that we pray and we remember that grace. You know, we become his offspring, his believers, because Jesus took our place on the cross. And you know, we talk about it all the time. We are now children of God. Uh, we're uh, justified because he claimed, because when we claim Christ as our Savior, this righteous servant of God is uh, uh, God is our Lord and our Savior. And you know, one of the things I read here that I was studying this week is one of the things that Paul wrote over there in chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10. Paul uh, says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart of a person believes, resulting in the righteous, and with his mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. Uh, I hope, you know, if someone ever asks you, and I'm sure it, as a believer there's somewhere in your life or there's going to be somewhere in your life where you hear someone ask you, well, how do you become a Christian? How do you become a believer? Well, i tell you what, go to those verses right there and it's just a beautiful answer to that question. Uh, these verses, uh, you know, they give them and they said, and let them know this life of sin will be stripped away. You know, they'll be clothed with this Christ goodness, you know. My good friend, Andy Brigado, who's a member of this church here, and, and I talk to Andy a lot, uh, he's walked into prisons and jails, uh, even the jails around here, for many years with this very message. These people that think they can't receive salvation, they can. Uh, if you remember nothing else from this lesson, Please all always remember this. Jesus is superior to every other expression of God. The angels, the prophets, or any other expression of God that we see and we read in the Word of God. The suffering servant that Isaiah prophesies about in his verses is not only an exact reputation, a representation of God, but he's God himself in human body. So when you're watching this and you're seeing and you're reading about Jesus Christ, that's what you're reading about. And you can go back and start with this story of God's plan all the way in Genesis and through Isaiah and all the way through Revelation. And you're going to hear God's plan. Uh, you know, and I hope this week, I hope uh, you have a blessed week. I hope that when we close here with prayer, you're thinking about some of the things we've read here, and I hope maybe I've opened your eye to some place else you want to go and study further with it. But, uh, you know, I gain, I'll be leaving here, and I'll go in here to Mr. Benner, Benner, Von Benner's class and listen to um, some of the things he's been teaching us over in Genesis. And, and it connects right to Isaiah, which connects right to Jesus, what connects right to Revelation. So, I hope you have a great week, and just please join me in a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, what a powerful message you give us today as we study your word through your prophet Isaiah. We were reminded your son Willie died a sacrificial death, so we might become your children. I pray, Father, that we never forget that. I pray for all who are listening today. I pray for all who are children of God that through the study of your word, we are strengthened. We are enlightened and granted the peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I pray, Heavenly Father, for all those who are sick, that you give them healing. I pray today, Father, for those who are lost in addiction of sin and pride. I humbly ask this healing prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and I hope to see you next week.